Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next installment of the Science Speaker Series here at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And uh, thank you to the Jim and Linda Lee Planetarium for hosting this uh, event on YouTube. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Hardigree Ullman from uh, Caltech. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin has been working Hi, extremely uh, hard welcome. at uh, understanding planets and the way that they work and uh, how to determine how many planets there are and what the different types of planets are around different stars. And so Kevin's going to talk to us today about the history of exoplanets um, in the last couple decades and where we're going and how we're going to get there. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Kevin. And uh, uh, please take it away. Please take it away. All right, thank you, Noel. And thank you, everybody at Embry-Riddle for allowing me to talk about this fascinating subject of exoplanets. Um, I actually started my research on exoplanets as an undergraduate. Um, I was a member of the uh, Astronomy Club, and we, because we were in Arizona, we had access to some Arizona telescopes. Um, so we decided to put together a proposal to observe some uh, transiting exoplanets, which I'm going, which is going to be a big focus of what I talk about today. Um, and uh, that was sort of my first steps into research. So you as an undergrad can uh, get into exoplanet research, and it's a very rapidly evolving, rapidly changing uh, field, and I highly encourage you to uh perhaps pursue that as a research avenue. Uh, but I want to start off asking a very simple question. Uh, why? Why do we study exoplanets? Why do we want to study planets beyond our solar system? Um, there are many answers to this question. There are many more questions that this simple question poses. Uh, but I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, why do we study exoplanets? And uh, to me, I have my own reasons, uh, but very simply, we want to place our own context within the cosmos. Uh, we want to understand, uh, are there other Earth-like planets out there? Um, are we alone? Uh, all these big philosophical questions, but in order to do that, we need to find the planets first. So I want to start off with a major, major caveat. Um, all we know and all we can know about exoplanets currently is a little bit limited by our knowledge of our own solar system. So in our, within our own solar system, we have eight or so planets, um, including four rocky planets close to the sun and four gaseous planets further out. And a lot of what we can know and understand about the properties of these exoplanets that we're discovering is based on what we know about our own solar system. And we've barely scratched the surface of our knowledge of our own solar system. So there are many biases and uh, also a lot to learn about planets in general within our own solar system. So I, uh, I want you to keep that in mind that um, these, thing, these biases exist and our knowledge is a little bit limited but we want to push our, our boundaries of discovery. So to start off, I will explain a few very common detection methods. Um, there, are, there are several different detection methods. I'm only going to talk about three here. Uh, for starting off with uh, direct imaging, let's go out and just take a picture of an exoplanet. That would be ideal. Um, that would be Wonderful if we could go just take a picture of the planet, see that it's there, but that's actually extremely hard to do. Mostly because uh, the stars that planets orbit are about a billion times brighter than the planets. So in order to, um, in order to actually directly image a planet, we have to, as this animation is showing, completely block out the starlight in order to see the planet. And so the direct imaging method, we've found maybe a couple dozen planets this way. Uh, we're able to constrain the mass of the planet. And this method, we can take a direct spectrum of the planet, 
allowing us to learn about the composition of the planet. So this is a really powerful tool, but we're currently limited um, to observing very young uh, star systems, uh, about less than 100 million years old stellar systems, where the planets are still in the formation process and the, the planets are uh, emitting their own uh, radiation. Uh, so they're easier to detect uh, once we block out the light from the star. Uh, we're also currently limited to giant planets, so Jupiter-like planets on very wide orbits, uh, larger than, uh, say, the orbit of, uh, of our own Jupiter in our solar system. So I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about direct imaging, but this is currently the only way that we can directly take a picture of a planet. But I do want to show you a really cool animation. This is um, the HR8799 system. This is real data. Those are, there are four planets in this system that we can find. Um, and this little animation shows these planets moving over time with respect to the star. You see these little, um, these little blips that are moving. Uh, and I, I just think that's fascinating from the year 2009 to 2016. Now on the bottom there is the scale of the planets. I said these are giant planets, so these are bigger than Jupiter, um, and they're very wide orbits. That scale on the bottom, 20 AU, uh, our own planet Uranus is at about 20 AU from astronomical units, 20 times further from the sun uh, than the Earth is. So I'm not going to talk too much more about direct imaging, but uh, I just think it's a really cool thing and we can produce really cool videos like this. Uh, the next method uh, that was really kind of the workhorse uh, for uh, the first about 20 years of exoplanet detection is the radial velocity method. And um, Professor Richardson can definitely tell you a lot more about the radial velocity method because um, the radial velocity technique was originally used to um, detect binary star systems. But uh, when you have two objects, when you have a planet orbiting a star, uh, the planet doesn't actually orbit the star. They actually orbit a common center of mass. And so what happens when you observe a star, if you take a spectrum of the star, uh, you'll see spectral lines. And if it's high enough resolution and you take many spectra over time, uh, due to the Doppler effect, you will notice those lines shift if there's another body in the system um, causing the star to wobble a little bit. So this graphic shows you um, on the top left sort of a top-down view of the, the geometry of the system. Uh, below that is just a sort of edge-on view. And then this plot shows you the sin uh, sinusoidal nature of this radial velocity. Um, and so you see the, the motion of the star wobbling uh, due to the um, planet uh, interactions. This allows you to constrain the minimum mass of the star, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but uh, this method is also currently limited by our, our technology. Uh, this requires relatively bright stars and it's really, really hard to detect Earth-like planets. You need something pretty massive in order to perturb a, say, sun-like star. Uh, but we are making huge technological advances uh, in this field. Uh, next, we have uh, perhaps, I'm, I'm a bit biased because I do a lot of transit work, um, but the transit method, uh, if we go look at a star, and the planet happens to be in the correct geometry uh, with respect to our line of sight, it will block out a tiny, tiny fraction of the amount of starlight coming to us. So uh, this animation here, uh, it goes from an, a top-down view, uh, in which case we wouldn't actually be able to see the transit, but then it flips to the correct geometry, and you see a little drop in brightness. Uh, that drop in brightness uh, is proportional to the area, uh, the disk area of the, the planet uh, over the area of the star. So the radius squared uh, of the planet over the radius squared of the host star. So if we can measure 
the radius of the host star really well, we can get the radius of the planet. Um, for example, in our own solar system, uh, the planet Jupiter would create about a 1% drop in brightness uh, from the host star, whereas the Earth will create a 0.01% drop in brightness. So um, it's again, it's really hard to detect an Earth. Um, also, it requires the correct uh, transit geometry. So uh, if we were to try to find an Earth around a sun-like star orbiting at the same distance that the Earth is to our sun, uh, the transit probability is about 1 in 200. So you'd have to go observe statistically about 200 stars uh, for many years in order to tr potentially detect the transit of an Earth-like planet. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but what if you have more than one planet transiting in the system? Uh, you'll see some neat effects happening. Uh, you'll see the, the drop in brightness due to one planet. Uh, but then you might see other signals. Uh, if you see two planets that happen to coincidentally transit at the same time, you get some funky light curves. And we have actually detected uh, multiple transit systems. So that brings the need for this transit method that you need ways of confirming that the signal that you're seeing, the drop in brightness, is due to a specific planet. So in order to confirm a transiting planet, we need to observe it three times in transit. So the first time we get a transit signal. The second time, if the, the drop in brightness is about the same uh, or exactly the same as the first time, we get, okay, this is probably a planet. But then we need to observe it a third time to really make sure that we have all of the planet parameters, including the orbital period, correct. Um, so again, going back to our Earth model, if we wanted to confirm an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star, we'd have to observe continuously for three years, um, pointing at a star, uh, or pointing at at least 200 stars to detect one Earth-like planet. So uh, I'm going to uh, move on to a little bit of exoplanet discovery history. Uh, people have been thinking about exoplanets for hundreds, if not thousands of years, that there must be planets around other stars. Um, but it wasn't until the 1900s that we finally had technology. And uh, it wasn't until about the 1950s that we, the radial velocity technique started to be, people started thinking, hey, if we can get uh, binary star systems, maybe we can get down, push down even to lower masses to uh, see these planets. So the first claims, um, th it's a little bit messy. Uh, who and what planet is it technically the first exoplanet? Uh, but the first convincing argument perhaps happened in 1988 with the detection of a radial velocity signal around Gamma Cephei. Um, here is the plot of the, the radial velocity measurements over uh, um, six years. And if you just, your eyes are really good at noticing patterns, you might be able to see uh, sort of a periodic uh, pattern. And uh, the author suggested this could be due to a planet. Um, but a few years later, in 1992, they retracted their claims that this could be a planet because they just said the quality of this data is just too low. Um, it wasn't until 2002, when they had much better data, that this actually was confirmed as a planet, uh, Gamma Cephei AB. Um, the naming of exoplanets is, is kind of weird. Uh, if you have more than one star in a system, the stars get a capital letter starting with A um, to indicate that it's a star. Uh, so uh, this is around the primary star in the system. And then the planets uh, are given by lowercase, uh, starting with the letter B for the first planet that's discovered. Um, and there's a little bit of a mess with regard to naming planets in multiple uh, systems, uh, but I won't get into that. But this is potentially the first discovery of, a, of an exoplanet. 
Next, the following year in 1989, another group uh, with many more measurements, and this is much more convincing and they actually fit a nice curve to the data, uh, discovered a potentially planet-like body around HD 114762. I apologize for the terrible names for some of these systems, uh, but we have started naming uh, planets real names, but that's harder for me to keep track of. Um, but uh, with this radial velocity uh, system, uh, they estimated that the minimum mass of this planet-like body would be about 11 Jupiter masses, which is, it was pretty massive. Um, that's, uh, that's almost a brown dwarf, um, which brown dwarf is not quite a planet. It's too massive to be a planet, uh, not massive enough to be a star. Uh, but again, with this radial velocity technique, we only measure minimum mass. Uh, it wasn't until 2019 that we had very high precision uh, astrometric measurements uh, to sort of measure the inclination of the planet. And uh, they determined that the, plan the planet-like object was not actually a planet. It is more like 100 Jupiter masses. So this first, uh, one of these first planets is more like a star. So this probably is not a planet, unfortunately. All right, but we're starting to gain traction. Uh, by the early 90s, uh, I don't think this group was necessarily searching for planets. Um, but in 1992, uh, these observers were looking at a pulsar. Pulsar is a dead remnant of a massive star that's rapidly rotating, and it had it is emitting these electromagnetic beams out in jets. And if it's in the right geometry, we can observe that uh, from Earth, typically with radio telescopes. Um, and so this group was uh, observing this pulsar, this rapidly rotating pulsar, and they tried to fit a rotation signal. Uh, after they fit the rotation signal of the pulsar, they were left with this uh, top plot. Uh, which they noticed some correlated noise in the residual. Uh, so they decided to first fit a Keplerian orbit, a 92-day orbit, and when they do that, they notice this other residual. Uh, so they fit another rotation period at 66 days, and okay, they, there's this other signal. And finally, when fitting for the rotation of the pulsar, and these two orbital signals, uh, they actually found two planets that were about four times the mass of Earth orbiting around this dead star. Going back to uh, one of my first slides, we are very solar system centric in our thinking. Uh, before we discovered some of these planets, uh, uh, like the, the previous planets that I showed, those were both Jupiter size uh, planets um, orbiting pretty close to their host star, uh, that just completely threw off our notions of planet formation. We thought, oh, it, it makes sense that planets must form with rocky planets on the inside of the, uh, closer to the host star and then giant planets out further because they can retain gas because they're further away from the host star. Um, but then we get this discovery of planets around a dead star. That that's really weird. Um, so we know now that planets can survive the death of their host, host star. Uh, another sort of claim to fame uh, of first exoplanets was in 1995 uh, with the discovery of 51 uh, Pegasi b. This was the first uh, planet discovered around a sun-like star. Um, the other stars were, again, there was a dead star, there was a star much hotter than the sun, and then there was also a giant star, so an evolved star. Those were not sun-like. So in 1995, this star that is about the same temperature as the sun, maybe a little bit larger than the sun, um, they found a half Jupiter mass planet orbiting every 4.3 days. For context, um, in our solar system, Mercury orbits once every 80 days. So it's really weird to think that there are these planets that are orbiting really close to their host star. Um, uh, but this discovery uh, 
perhaps, no judgment here, but perhaps because we are very solar system centric, uh, this, uh, if you pay attention to the Nobel Prizes, this uh, discovery of the first planet around a sun-like star was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2019. Uh, this is phenomenal work, uh, by the way, um, and uh, we move on from our first exoplanet discovery. So I'll leave it up to you to decide which you would actually consider as the first exoplanet. But where have we gone uh, from there? Uh, so I'm gonna show you this video, which is going to show the cumulative detections. Uh, once we started discovering planets, we've been discovering planets every year, uh, several, uh, well, I'll show the video. So starting in 1989, we have the, that radio velocity detection, 1992, the first pulsar timing, 95, 51 pega CV. And the colors indicate the discovery method. It wasn't until 2002 that we discovered the first um, transiting planet. All right, so that went that went kind of quick. Um, uh, but in 2002, we discovered the first transiting planet. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom uh, here in this reddish color, uh, reddish orange, uh, you'll notice that radio velocity was really sort of the the technique that that pushed a lot of the early discoveries. In 2002, when we found our first transiting planet. Um, transit started to gain traction. And then we launched the Kepler telescope, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, in 2009, and transits pretty much took over completely uh, the discovery game. Uh, radial velocity continues to, to hold steady, but transits have become the, the new hot tool for discovering exoplanets. So that plot was, that, that video is a couple of years old. So here's uh, our discoveries to date. We've discovered 4,352 confirmed planets. And here's a list of all of the other techniques um, or all of the techniques that have been used to discover planets. Again, showing that transits sort of lead the detection space. So I brought up the Kepler mission. Um, earlier I mentioned that in order to discover an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star, uh, you have the transit probability of one in 200. So if you want to discover another Earth, let's go observe a lot, a lot of stars simultaneously. So that's sort of the basic concept of the Kepler mission. Let's stare at a patch of sky for um, over three years in order to get three transits, but go look at about 200,000 sun-like stars at once, and hopefully we can detect um, an, another Earth. Uh, so over here on the right, uh, sort of shows you the the field where Kepler is. Uh, it's a little bit hard unless you know constellations and um, can place this on the sky. But if you want to right now, uh, sitting at your, your desk or wherever you are, uh, put your fist out at arm's length. Uh, and if you hold that up to the sky at night, uh, your fist is about the size of the Kepler field. Um, so that's a pretty sizable um, patch of sky. Uh, for reference, if you put up your pinky finger uh, at arm's length uh, up to the night sky, uh, the tip of your finger is roughly the size of the full moon. So uh, just in comparison to the full moon, the Kepler field observed a lot, a big decent chunk of sky. Uh, Kepler sort of transformed the field of exoplanet science uh, and uh, to date, uh, the Kepler mission led to the discovery of about 2,400 confirmed planets and then another roughly 2,400 candidates that we have yet to confirm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Kepler wasn't able to reach the goal of finding another Earth around a sun-like star, um, like exactly like our sun, uh, for a few reasons. But in 2013, uh, a telescope in space needs uh, 
three what they call reaction wheels. They're, it's just a fancy term for a gyroscope. It needs three gyroscopes uh, to keep stabilization on three axes. Kepler was installed with four, just one as a backup. Uh, one of the reaction wheels had failed um, previously, and then in 2013, another reaction wheel failed. So uh, it only had two uh, stabilization gyroscopes. So the Kepler mission couldn't continue. But out of that, um, some very clever uh, engineers realized they could stabilize the spacecraft by using radiation pressure from the sun. So this diagram sort of shows how this works up top. Uh, the sun, uh, photons from the sun create a little pressure on the spacecraft. Um, and we can measure that pressure. And uh, the Kepler telescope was in an Earth trailing orbit. So it was in the same orbit as Earth is. It's just falling very slowly behind Earth in its orbit. So what we can do is use the pressure from the sun as a stabilization axis and point along the plane of the solar system. And we can do that for about 80 days at a time and stare at a new patch of sky using the thrusters uh, on Kepler to kind of uh, repoint and stabilize uh, uh, every so often just to keep the spacecraft stable, pointing at this new patch. But this allows us to stare at a different patch of sky every 80 days, uh, opening up exploration to um, more of the galaxy. So this uh, sort of illustrates that uh, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy and then the field, uh, the various fields that Kepler could look at. So between the years of 2014 and 2018, K2 extended Kepler's mission to search for exoplanets in different regions of the sky. Um, unfortunately, in 2018, uh, we knew this was going to happen. Uh, the fuel used to fire the thrusters ran out. So that effectively uh, ended the Kepler and K2 missions, but it really helped uh, revolutionize the fields of exoplanets. So this plot shows all of the fields. There were um, 18 fields that were uh, observed long enough to get really good science out of it. There was field zero, or campaign, they called them campaigns zero. Uh, that was just test engineering um, to make sure that we can, uh, that our concept works and then they did move to a campaign 19, but by that time, they think that the fuel was, had basically run dry. So it's really hard to extract data from that. Uh, but we were able to observe 18 different fields across the sky. Uh, so that greatly expanded the regions of sky that we could uh, look at. But now, uh, what about the rest of the sky? And you might have heard of the test that the TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Uh, that was launched in 2018, and it's the current uh, big exoplanet finding mission that's out there. And this ex extends the search to the entire sky. And so uh, this cartoon diagram on the left shows the patch, uh, the cameras, uh, they're aligned um, in this uh, rectangular pattern, but it can observe a 96 degree by 24 degree patch of sky at once. Um, and uh, TESS looks at a different sector every 27 days. So in the first year, uh, TESS was pointed toward the Southern hemisphere, rotating slightly um, every 27 days. Uh, and then after 27 days, uh, it rotated until it covered most of the southern hemisphere. Uh, what you'll see on this diagram on the right is uh, the colors indicate uh, overlapping regions. So some areas of sky, including these, these big circular regions, uh, were observed for almost a year. And so in those specific regions, you can find transiting planets out to longer orbital periods. And then the second year, they switched, flipped up to the northern hemisphere and with the same goal of covering most of the sky, but they had to change their observing strategy slightly because in the first year they noticed that they were getting stray light um, 
into the detectors, uh, I think from either Earth or the sun. And so they wanted to minimize the amount of stray light that they were getting into the detectors. So they had to shift a few of their observing fields. So that's why you see this uh, kind of big hole. Um, you'll also notice a strip. Uh, that's the ecliptic plane, the plane of our solar system where uh, K2 observed. And so there's a little bit of overlap between the test fields and the K2 fields. Um, and there is definitely overlap between the uh, test fields and the Kepler field that will give us even longer time baselines to search for um, planets. And I want to show you this really cool um, animation put together by Ethan Kruse. Uh, showing just what TESS observed in its first two years, the TESS, the full sky. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. Um, this is real data. Um, you can download this data, you can zoom in, uh, and you can potentially find planets. And that's what we are doing with this TESS data. So I'll let it run once more and then move on. All right. So what can we actually learn about exoplanets? We have, we're dis we have all these detection techniques. We now have numbers of planets. What can we actually learn? So I want to show a plot of what planets we're actually finding. Uh, this is a plot of orbital period in days versus planet mass. And I'm going through time. I have some of the solar, all of the solar system planets uh, plotted here in uh, mass and orbital period space. And uh, the colors and shapes of the points indicate the discovery method. And there's a lot to take in on this plot. Um, so uh, as you'll notice, uh, primarily, uh, most of the discoveries we've made, again, are from the radial velocity technique and the transit technique. Um, and they are both, uh, a lot of the radial velocity detections are these more massive planets um, at wider, and it can probe wider orbital periods. Um, whereas the transits uh, were limited to closer in shorter orbital periods, uh, but we can get, um, smaller planets that way. Uh, I mentioned the imaging planets. If you'll look in the top right, the squares, those are our directly imaged planets, the ones that were discovered from direct imaging. These are large planets, larger than the size of Jupiter typically, um, uh, orbiting very far away from their host star. Uh, I will show another version of this plot, but this time in orbital period, um, and radius space. Um, so over time, the, or again, the early detections were all these big planets, these massive planets mostly. Um, then we started discovering some transiting planets. Uh, those again were, uh, were typically these giant planets. And it wasn't until we started launching these, these space missions that we finally uh, started getting more planets that were smaller than the size of Jupiter. Uh, so we're, we're really able to get down, uh, we're pushing down uh, to Earth-sized planets. But again, you'll notice we aren't really covering any of the space of any of the planets in our own solar system. And that's partly because of um, our own technological limitations, but it would be great to, uh, say, have another Kepler mission that could run longer duration to potentially find these Earth-sized uh, planet, transiting planets. Um, we'll hopefully eventually get there, but uh, right now we're learning all sorts of things from all of these planets that we are detecting. So one, some of the physical properties you can measure, uh, once the Kepler mission launched, uh, it's really great if you can combine uh, detection methods. So if you have a planet that transits, you get its radius. If you uh, can also measure its radial velocity, uh, you can get its mass. There are other techniques that you can use to constrain mass. 
Um, but uh, if you have a transiting planet, then you also get the inclination angle. So you can actually confirm the mass, not set a minimum mass limit. But when you plot uh, mass versus radius, you get density. And so we can learn some basic composition of these planets uh, just by plotting, by having the information from their radius and mass. And so for reference, I've plotted uh, Earth, Venus, uh, Uranus, and Neptune uh, for these planets that we've actually discovered. And here the lines represent different uh, models of composition. So uh, up top would be a completely water uh, world or the planet would have the density of water. Uh, this middle dotted line is a rocky planet. And then the lower line is a completely iron planet. So it has the density of iron. And so we can learn about the composition of these planets just by knowing their mass and radius. If we look further uh, at uh, properties uh, using the transit method, we can do something called transmission spectroscopy. Uh, if you look at a planet transit at different wavelengths, molecules in the atmosphere of the planet absorb different wavelengths of light. So you might act, yeah, um, if you observe at different wavelengths, you might notice a difference between the transit depths. And so this is a an exaggerated cartoon illustration, but uh, observing at different wavelengths, we see different um, we just see different transit depths. So we can begin to learn about what's in the atmosphere uh, if we have different transit depths. And a lot of this work has been done with hot Jupiters. So here's um, here's some real data. The all of the colored points are actual measurements. There are many, many different measurements at different wavelengths for these uh, hot Jupiters. So these are Jupiter-sized planets that are very close into their host star that are very warm. Um, and so uh, once we have the data, we can produce models. Um, there are different groups that uh, put in different physical properties, generate models, and these are sort of the best fit models to the data. And so up top here, you have uh, a few features that are noted in some of the spectra. You have a sodium line, a potassium line, and then a water, uh, a water band. And so we can be begin to learn about the uh, chemical composition of these planets if we can observe the transits at different um, wavelengths. And so uh, these, this shows sort of a range of the diversity of hot Jupiters out there. So I've talked about some properties we can get from our observations, but we definitely don't want to forget the stars. Uh, we don't know anything about planets without first knowing very well um, the properties of the host stars. So the spectral sequence of stars uh, is O, B, A, F, G, K, M. O is being the biggest um, and the hottest stars. Uh, so it's actually backwards in this cartoon diagram. O's are on the right, uh, very hot. Um, o, o, B, and A stars, go talk to Professor Richardson if you want to know more about those. Uh, but uh, some of the biases from our searches for exoplanets are around sun-like stars. So these F, G, and K-like star -like stars. Um, so that's where a lot of the focus and drive for exoplanet research has been. Uh, but uh, knowing very precisely the parameters of the, st the host stars uh, allowed us to learn something about planets. So uh, once uh, there's, uh, there was a group uh, with the California Kepler survey, they measured very precisely the properties of host stars of I think about 2000 planets. Uh, they refined the radius measurements of these Kepler planets and they uh, they made this plot. This plot shows is a histogram of the planet size um, and the number of planets per star. Um, but what you'll notice here, uh, for reference, again, the Earth radius is one Earth radius. The radius of Neptune and Uranus is about four Earth radii. Uh, the radius of Jupiter is about um, 11 Earth radii. So what you'll notice is that for planets that form uh, with orbital periods shorter than 100 days, 
around sun-like stars, there aren't really many Jupiter-sized planets. A lot of our earlier de earliest detections of exoplanets were of these Jupiter-sized planets, but that is probably a detection bias because uh, it's a it's a lot easier to find a planet that is massive um, or has a large radius uh, than it is to find a smaller planet. Uh, then Kepler happens and we're actually identifying planets. Uh, most of the planets that we were identifying with Kepler are unlike any planet that we have in our own solar system, which is one of the most incredible uh, discoveries that came out of Kepler. Uh, most planets are between the size of Earth and Neptune, and we don't have any planets like that in our own solar system. But uh, one interesting feature is what we call the planet radius valley. We have a peak of planets at about 2.4 Earth radii, and then we have another peak of planets around 1.3 Earth radii, but between them there's this valley. There's a lack of planets uh, with radii about 1.8 Earth radii. And the, there's, there are some theories about um, planet formation uh, that this, this planet radius valley was predicted, but it wasn't until we got precise stellar characterization and uh, observed many different planets that we actually detected this uh, theoretical uh, prediction. And uh, the theory is um, planets close into their host star uh, if they're if they don't have enough mass, they their atmospheres will be blown away by the host star. Um, if they're massive enough, they they can retain uh, their atmospheres. So we we can learn something about the planet formation process from observing a bunch of different stars. And it wasn't with until we got a very precise uh, stellar characterization that this um, this was validated. But what about an M dwarf, a star half the size or, or uh, even smaller than the sun? Um, and here, if you can see, uh, I've plotted the Earth in random locations on each of these stars. Uh, it should be a lot easier to detect an Earth around an M dwarf. So M dwarfs have a, many advantages. Um, M dwarfs constitute about 70% of the stars in our own galaxy. Uh, so, uh, so they're overwhelmingly uh, the most abundant stars in the galaxy. So uh, because they're uh, much less massive than the sun, they're much more fuel efficient. So they live longer than our sun. Our sun is gonna live 10 billion years. Uh, most M dwarfs are going to live longer than the current age of the universe. Um, when you have an M dwarf, as this diagram shows, uh, the transit depth, the ratio of the planet uh, uh, area to the ratio of the star area is greater. So on, up here on the left, this top line shows the transit depth of an Earth orbiting a sun. Uh, so a 0.01% dip in brightness. Uh, the, blue line shows Jupiter transiting the sun, so a 1% drop in brightness. But then for an M dwarf, you have some, uh, an Earth orbiting an M dwarf, you have something uh, in between. And so uh, it should be easier to detect an Earth-sized planet orbiting an M dwarf. Also, uh, because the, uh, the mass difference is less in an M dwarf and Earth system, you would expect higher radial velocity signal. Uh, but also, uh, astronomers studying exoplanets like to throw habitable zone out there. Um, you'll see a lot of articles discussing habitable planets. A lot, there's a lot of hype, um, and I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, habitable zones are more complex than, than we think, but um, I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. There are some disadvantages to M dwarfs. Most M dwarfs are very faint. Uh, if you go out and look at the night sky, uh, basically every single M dwarf you wouldn't be able to see with your naked eye. Um, M dwarfs are intrinsically faint, uh, so you need very powerful telescopes to uh, see, uh, to get uh, 
exquisite data from them. So if we are trying to measure radial velocities, you need pretty close by and fairly bright MDORFs to, to really get good measurements. MDORFs are also very active stars. Um, and because they live very long, they're active for very long periods of time, billions of years. Uh, they throw off uh, flares. Uh, they have basically uh, world destroying events much more regularly than uh, stars like our own sun. So that throws into the question uh, the possibility of having habitable planets around MDORS. But they're still worth looking at. And from the Kepler mission, uh, we've determined that uh, short period planets are the most common around MDORS. This could be slightly a detection bias. It's easier to, to detect and confirm planets on shorter orbital periods. And MDORFs have a lot of smaller planets on short orbital periods. So here we've, we've plotted uh, star temperature versus the number of planets per star from many different groups measurements. And uh, here on the right is F, G, and K sun-like stars. Uh, from our calculations, there's uh, every other star has a planet around these sun-like stars, whereas every M dwarf probably has a planet uh, within a 50-day orbital period. So uh, planets are most common, or short period planets are most common around these M dwarfs. Uh, there have also been some recent discoveries uh, that are extremely exciting, including our own closest neighbor, neighboring star, Proxima Centauri. Uh, in 2016, uh, a 1.3 Earth mass planet was discovered around Proxima Centauri, um, which is very exciting for, I don't know, very far future prospects of potentially going there, maybe. Um, uh, there, it's also, this planet is also likely in what we consider the habitable zone. So uh, this is very, very exciting news that our own closest neighboring star has a planet and it's a little bit bigger than Earth. There's also uh, the M dwarf TRAPPIST-1. Uh, this has seven Earth-sized planets. Um, TRAPPIST-1 is what we call a late type. It's a very, er, a late type M dwarf. It's a very cold M dwarf, pretty much like uh, the last type of star that would still be considered a star rather than a brown dwarf, it's still uh, undergoing nuclear fusion. Uh, but this star has seven Earth-sized planets, three that exist within the habitable zone or could, uh, as this diagram shows, could have liquid water. Two of the planets are very close in. Uh, water couldn't exist um, in liquid form. Uh, and then the outer planets are a bit too cold, so they wouldn't necessarily be able to have uh, water. But I keep talking about habitability. Uh, habitability is, and the habitable zone is a bit more complex than just liquid water can exist in this region. Uh, there are all sorts of factors to consider this diagram, uh, which I won't go over too much, but we have to consider the planetary systems, it's, uh, their cells, uh, the, the effects from the host star, and then when you're talking about habitability, you really have to consider chemistry and biological processes. And so, uh, here on this diagram, anything written in blue uh, is something that we can actually observe and we can actually measure. Uh, anything that's green, uh, we can still uh, detect, but we need models to help interpret uh, what those mean. And then anything in orange, we uh, can only really model this. So habitability is more complex than just water, um, uh, but that's something when you read something about a planet in the habitable zone of the star, it's a, a bit more complicated than just, oh, liquid water can exist on the planet. So going back uh, to earlier, um, what about K2? I talked a, bit, a lot about Kepler results and we discovered this radius valley. Uh, Kepler observed, uh, as this diagram shows, a single patch of sky it stared for three and a half years. Um, this is uh, these two diagrams show a cartoon of the galaxy uh, with the bulge 
of the galaxy in the center, and then there's a thin disk and then a thick disk. And uh, this plot shows every single star that Kepler looked at. Uh, the black points are the sun-like stars. The red points are uh, the M dwarfs. Uh, Kepler was, because it was designed to look at um, mostly sun-like stars, it observed only about 2,000 M dwarfs. So there's a much smaller patch of M dwarfs that it observed. Whereas K2, uh, we realized, hey, we're looking at different patches of the sky and we're discovering a lot of uh, Earth-sized planets around these M dwarfs. Let's go stare at a bunch more M dwarfs. So on the right here, uh, we greatly expanded our search for exoplanets to all regions of the galaxy. We extended our search for M dwarfs and uh, we can, what can we actually learn from that? Well, let's go back. And this is some of the work that uh, I did um, last year. And we identified with K2 data alone, uh, the planet radius value. This required, again, precise uh, stellar measurements. We really constrained the radii of these host stars and out popped this radius value. Uh, Again, we're detecting mostly planets that we don't find in our own solar system. Again, for reference, Neptune is about four Earth radii. radii. Um, we're discovering, and this plot also, it's really hard to detect planets smaller than the Earth. So that's why there's kind of a tapering off of planets beyond there. It's not necessarily that those planets don't exist. It's, it's mostly that that's the limits of our, our detection currently. But, uh, for K2, we identify the radius valley, which means that uh, planet formation probably happens similar across the entire galaxy and not just this um, single patch of sky, which is, uh, which is really cool result. I've gone over just, I've just barely scratched the surface of exoplanet exploration and discovery and um, some physical properties that we can measure uh, of these planets. Uh, this diagram, I apologize if it, it's a little bit hard to read, uh, but it kind of illustrates the past, present, and future of exoplanet discovery. Um, so ground-based observatories have been kind of the workhorse, and especially for follow-up um, of exoplanet systems. Uh, there are many uh, observatories, including backyard at-home observatories that have really contributed to uh, exoplanet science. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to forget about those, but uh, the space missions, uh, once you get above Earth, Earth's atmosphere and can uh, mitigate the effects of Earth's atmosphere, you can really get uh, incredible information about planets. So Hubble and Spitzer telescopes uh, launched in the, Hubble launched in 1990, Spitzer launched in 2003. Those have been crucial for um, for really pushing the, the boundaries of what we can learn about these exoplanets. Uh, Kuro was a, a European uh, mission. Uh, it found a few planets, um, uh, but it, uh, it didn't really find that many, but it sort of led the way for space-based um, exoplanet transit missions, so including Kepler. So Kepler... Uh, Kepler and K2, um, I've already talked a lot about that. Uh, in 2013, the uh, Gaia mission was launched. Gaia has, in at least recent years, very much transformed astronomy. Um, it, Gaia has really helped us uh, get much better stellar properties just uh, by being able to measure distances to stars. We can learn so much um, about uh, stars themselves. So Gaia has been crucial in really understanding the properties of stars. Um, the TESS mission launched a couple of years ago. Uh, hopefully it'll last uh, for many, many years to come. Uh, and uh, in 2019, another European mission, the Kiops satellite was launched. Uh, and this is doing space-based follow-up um, of exoplanets, transit follow-up. Uh, to look specifically at Earth to Neptune size exoplanets and really constrain the properties like atmospheric properties um, of these planets. Uh, JWST is supposed to launch, fingers crossed, um, on Halloween this year. And 
everybody's waiting for it to be able to really revolutionize and push uh, our understanding of the atmospheres of planets with uh, the transmission spectroscopy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Plato, uh, a European mission, is going to be launching, I think, sometime in the next decade. And uh, it's another, uh, I guess, Kepler-like mission uh, to study Earth-like planets uh, around sun-like stars. Um, and then in the late 2020s, the aerial mission is going to look at, try to uh, look at the chemical composition of these planets. Uh, so there are many, many space missions. Uh, there's a very promising future for exoplanet science. And I really encourage you to uh, look into this. Uh, how can you get involved? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, go visit the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, I work with some very talented, wonderful people who keep track of all of the, the details and all of the statistics and all of everything uh, you need about these exoplanets um, is on this exoplanet archive. So I encourage you to look that up. Um, currently, because TESS is the big space-based mission, uh, you can actually do follow-up yourself. Um, I'm not sure when people are getting back to campus. Uh, hopefully you can get back to your campus observatory. Uh, perhaps you can do some follow-up and help confirm uh, some of these exoplanets with your uh, campus telescope. Um, there's also the exoplanet follow-up observing uh, program. Uh, you can check out that link too. Uh, there's also Planet Hunters. Uh, this is a sort of citizen scientist or community science uh, project where uh, they've put up how you can look through these light curves and actually help uh, discover new planets. So that's through Planet Hunters. And then last but not least, I really, really encourage you to look up System Sounds. Uh, this group um, is basically taking exoplanet data and figuring out different ways of conveying that data. So uh, they're doing what's called sonification. They're turning data into sounds. And they have some incredible clips um, that I really encourage you to check out. So with that, um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I don't know if I have some time for questions, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. <clears throat> we greatly appreciate your talk and your time. Um, we, I think we just had one question come up during the talk, and hopefully people can maybe ask a few more in the chat if they're interested. Um, and basically, I, I think you've uh, hinted at some of this, and it's uh, why is it so difficult to spot exoplanets when we know of so many stars and galaxies out there? Yeah, that's a... That's a great question. Um, uh, and let's see. Uh, just from uh, some of these techniques that I was talking about uh, for discovery, um, some of it comes down to uh, the, say, for example, the transiting method. Uh, you need to stare at a lot of uh, different um, stars for a very long period of time in order to find these signals. And like I mentioned, we need to detect at least three transiting events to confirm the planetary nature uh, of these signals. And so uh, it wasn't really until we got a telescope up in space that could observe continuously that we really got this flood of new discoveries. Um, uh, other observations from the ground with like the radial velocity technique uh, that requires just monitoring a bunch of different stars over a long period of time. Um, and you really need to fill in uh, the, the, the plot. Um, <coughs> let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, this one of the earliest discoveries um, plotted here on the bottom, these are individual measurements of the stars uh, over many, many years. They had to retract their planetary claim, but then it wasn't until 2002 when they got a lot more data that they could actually say, yes, this, this really is a planet. We really think that it is a planet. So it takes a long time. Um, 
planets, we know planets are common. Uh, most stars will probably have a planet. Uh, it's just, we need to push the limits of our technology. We really need to observe a lot more stars and hopefully uh, we're getting there. We're, we've discovered, uh, we've confirmed over 4,300 planets as of today. So now uh, we, have, we have a bunch of planets. Now it's a matter of, okay, what, what about those planets? Uh, what can we learn about those planets? Can we really get the properties of these planets? So hopefully that answers your question. And the other question we have today, uh, Kevin, and I think this will be the last one for today, is are there any theoretical ideas about observing exoplanets that help us learn more about these planets in general? Theoretical. Um, yeah, um, a lot of our, a lot of our, uh, models of exoplanets, like uh, transmission spectra, these are theoretical models based on what we understand about physics. Um, a lot of these models are created based on um, just knowing basic physics or chemistry, and then run, creating a model based on just what we know about physics and chemistry. Then we go and take these observations and we learned that, okay, our models are okay. We're, we're, we're predicting from these models uh, what's actually going on because our observations now sort of confirm that our models are okay. There are also a lot of instances where our models aren't quite there. Um, we need to modify our models all the time in order to, uh, to determine what our observations are telling us. So, uh, there, there are a lot of instances of that. The planet Radius Valley, um, this was predicted from models, uh, but it wasn't until we had exquisite stellar characterization and observations of enough planets that we could actually uh, confirm the, the theory behind this. So I hope that answers your question too. All right. Um, thank you very, very much for coming today, Kevin, and giving this lovely talk and uh, telling us something about the way that planets work and how we've discovered so many around other stars. Um, I really appreciate your time and effort in putting this talk together. Um, <clears throat> with that in mind, it looks like there's no other questions coming up on the chat online. Um, <clears throat> If you have questions and you're an Embry-Riddle student, uh, feel free to either email myself or you can also contact Kevin, who has uh, given his contact information on this slide um, or on the slide that he showed today. Um, so with that in mind, I thank you again and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.